So welcome to the EAP Occasional Seminar. I am Kelly Swayze. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Diversity and Inclusion Liaison for East Asia Pacific Division of Fulbright. Um, I am a white woman with blonde hair and blue eyes wearing a green and purple blouse sitting in front of um, a cream colored wall with a bluish batik panel behind me and a wooden door. Um, I'm very excited to host this seminar today, and I just want to thank the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs for their support of this series, as well as my colleagues in Fulbright, East Asia and the Pacific Division who helped me with the organization of these talks. Um, the purpose of these seminars is really just to give a chance to all of you around the AAP region to engage in discussion about contemporary theories and issues related to diversity, equity, access, and inclusion um, as they've evolved in the West. So we're inviting speakers to share their expertise on the narratives, challenges, and advancements that shape the perspectives and concerns of some of our Fulbright program participants hailing from the United States. And today I'm really thrilled and honored to introduce Kenny Fries, who is our speaker. Um, he will be giving a presentation entitled In the Province of the Gods, a Disabled Fulbrighter Abroad. Um, I'm really grateful that he has taken time out of his busy schedule and gotten up very early in Berlin this morning to speak to us. Hi, Kenny. Nice to have you with us. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Um, Kenny teaches in the MFA in Creative Writing program at Goddard College, and he's also a very active public scholar and artist. He edited Staring Back, The Disability Experience from the Inside Out, which is a seminal text in disability studies. And he is the author of several books, including The History of My Shoes and the Evolution of Darwin's Theory, Body Remember, a Memoir, and In the Province of the Gods, which de details his experience as a Fulbright scholar in Japan. He's also published several volumes of poetry, including In the Gardens of Japan, Desert Walking, and Anesthesia. Um, in addition to receiving Fulbright grants to both Japan and Germany, Kenny has also received grants from the DAD, DAAD, the German Academic Exchange, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, and Toronto Arts Council. He was an honoree on Diversibility's inaugural Disability Impact List and a DICOR Fellow in Transatlantic Diverse and Inclusive Public Remembrance. And Remembrance is also a part of the focus of his current project entitled Stumbling Over History, Disability and the Holocaust. Excerpts from which are featured in his video series, What Happened Here in the Summer of 1940. For those of you who are interested in hearing more about the project, I've put the link to that video series on YouTube in the chat. So if you scroll back to the top of the chat, you can find the link there. And Kenny also recorded an interview about this work with former EUR diversity coordinator, Susanna Hamsha for our Fulbright Forward podcast. And I've included that link in the chat as well. So I'm gonna let Kenny get to it. And when he's finished with his talk, I will address a few questions for him um, that were sent in earlier with the registration form. And after that, I'll open the floor for additional questions and discussions. So Silicon, welcome Kenny. We're really excited to have you here today. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, as um, Kelly said, I'm in Berlin and it's you know a little after eight in the morning and I'm usually not in existence until I'd say maybe Oh, one in the afternoon or something. So it's a, it's a bit early for me. So um, I am a, a Caucasian male with short, dark hair and uh, round reading glasses that don't work anymore. I'm wearing a uh, reddish purplish shirt. Um, behind me is a very messy bookcase and a blank uh, white wall. So I thought what I would do today is um, in the time that I have is read a little small section from the beginning of In the Province of the Gods, which gives people an idea of what it was like for this person to go to a country that um, he didn't know much about. Um, and the part I'm gonna read is actually not when I was a Fulbrighter because I actually had a, I was a creative arts fellow of the Japan US Friendship Commission and the National Endowment for the Arts before my full, three years before my Fulbright. So my Fulbright happens in the third part of the book. And this is the first part of the book. But I thought it would give an interesting, a different kind of perspective on what it was like uh, when I first got there and the uh, things that happened as a disabled person, the things that I realized. Um, it's only like five pages, so it won't take very long. And then I prepared some uh, things about my experience, which I thought might be helpful for, for all of you. So that's what I will do. 
So this is, um, this is my entrance into Japan for the first time in the chapter called Genkan. Um, and uh, we'll just go from there. When I land at Narita Airport, the sky is the dull gray, typical, I'm told, of Tokyo weather during the late spring rainy season. As soon as I'm off the plane, many dark blue suited Japanese businessmen talking on their keitai surround me in the terminal. Hi, hi, they respond as they bow to what I imagine to be an autocratic boss on the other end of the cell phone connection. On the one and a half hour train ride from Narita to Tokyo, I get my first glimpse of Japan. In the late afternoon mist, a man tending the rice paddy is smaller in comparison to his surroundings. It is not that the man himself is smaller, nor are his surroundings larger. The way the man fits into his surroundings seems different, but also familiar. What I see looks like the Ukyo A woodblock prints I have seen in museums and art books. It is as if I have somehow entered the scale, the perspective of Hokusai's and Hiroshigi's floating world. As I look from the paddy to the hills, I notice the tops of Japanese hills are more pointed here. The many different shades of green in the grass and trees are more distinct than the gray of the afternoon. Lime, emerald, olive, ivy, greens with tints of blue, of yellow, even a green as dark as the billiard table green of my left behind bedroom walls. Arriving at Tokyo Station, I make my way through what is the largest and busiest train station in which I have ever been. Wide lines of people surge every which way. Countless signs, some even in English or a version that resembles English, direct passengers to color-coded subway lines, commuter lines, Shinkansen lines, as well as to the seemingly endless number of station exits. How much easier this, I should say that previously to this, I. I separated from uh, my, my then boyfriend, Ian. So that's, that's the reference. How much easier this would be with Ian, who is more comfortable in a bordering on chaos crowd. Pausing amid all the constant motion, I finally find a sign with a symbol of a taxi. As I make my way in the direction the arrow seems to be pointing, I play over and over in my head the short phrase I learned, Ropangi Kudasai which will supposedly politely tell the taxi driver the area of Tokyo where I want to go. Making my way to what I hope will be the correct exit, I check in my pocket for the copy of the Japanese map emailed to me by the International House, where I'll be staying until my apartment is ready in two days. You should hand this map to the taxi driver, the accompanying message said. Addresses are very difficult to find in Tokyo and in the rest of Japan. Surprisingly, all works as it should, and the taxi drops me off at the International House, where after checking in, I fall asleep in the single bed in my small, narrow room. The next morning, I get instructions from the cultural office at the I House of where to get my very own keitai and order my meishi, name cards, two essentials to navigating life successfully in Japan. Walking in Roppongi, my mind and body are lit up like the countless neon lights, which here in Tokyo are vertical. Signs in kanji, hiragana, and katakana, the three distinct pictorial and glyphic systems that comprise modern Japanese, as well as romaji, English letters, hang at every sight level. Cherry cat, exciting plaza, poet box. What do these signs mean? Roaming the winding alleys, I notice the electrical poles and wires that line the narrow streets. I wonder how secure they would be during an earthquake or a typhoon. Many friends and many fires and natural disasters have devastated Tokyo. Impermanence seems closer to the surface here. Inundated by so many unfamiliar sounds and images, will I remember my way back to the eye house? Tokyo might be the only city in the world where you can make a right, another right, another right, and another right, and not end up in the same place as you began. 
Foreigners unfamiliar with Japanese customs often startle their hosts by walking into a home without taking off their shoes. I don't want to be one of those foreigners, but the custom of removing shoes is problematic for someone like me. Japanese remove their shoes upon arrival and when departing, put them back on with ease with sta while standing. Because of my differently shaped feet, I was born missing bones in both of my legs. I need specially designed orthopedic shoes as well as a cane to get around. And even if I could manage around the house without them, I need to sit down to be able to take off and put on my bulky differently shaped shoes. Without a chair in the genkan, the entranceway, I must, however, ungracefully sit down on the floor. When I move into my Majirodai apartment, I am relieved to see the genkan has a step high enough to sit down comfortably and take off my shoes when I enter and put on my shoes when I leave. I am also relieved that I am able to walk without shoes around my narrow two-room, thinly carpeted Tokyo apartment, mostly pain-free. When Eiko-san, my landlady, comes over to see why my cable motive isn't or wasn't working, she says, Shitsurai shumas, after taking off her shoes and stepping up into the apartment. Then I notice all Japanese visitors, including the cable company man who come to see what's wrong with my internet connection, all say this phrase as they enter. Brenda, a Japanese-American poet from New York and fellow grant recipient, lives upstairs. She has already been here for four months and knows some Japanese. I ask her about the phrase. It literally means the person is sorry or embarrassed they're about to commit a wrongful act, she explains. Embarrassed, wrongful. All they're doing is taking off their shoes and entering my apartment, which I invited them to do. Welcome to Japan. Preparing to come to Japan, I promised myself I would take advantage of every opportunity that presented itself, that I would follow every lead I could possibly follow. But right now, I have no leads. Besides Otataki Hirotata's memoir, No One's Perfect, there is not much about disabled Japanese that has been translated into English. I contact Otataki's agent. I am rebuffed after one email. Otataki-san doesn't want to talk about being disabled. He wants to be a sports writer. Instead, I explore my new neighborhood. On the small shopping street nearby, I discover the corner stand hawking roast chicken breasts, potato croquettes, and assorted fried and boiled Japanese side dishes. The street seems not to have changed much since the Edo period. There are two short, squat elderly women dressed in loose-fitting one-piece house dresses, cotton scarves wound around their heads. Every day they sit outside a ground floor apartment, seemingly more dilapidated than the other low-rise buildings on the street. Passing by, I often look into what I assume to be their apartment, nothing but chaotic piles of things they must have kept for countless years. I quickly avert my eyes. When I first walk down the street, these women stare at me. Who are those women who are sitting outside on the shopping street? I ask Brenda. Aren't they wild, Brenda says. They stare at me all the time, she adds, like all the shopkeepers stared at first. They were flustered when I first arrived and I couldn't speak any Japanese. They were afraid they wouldn't be able to help me because they couldn't understand me. Perhaps the two women stared at me not because I am disabled, but because I am new to the neighborhood and because I am a gaijin, a foreigner, this is something I had never thought of before. After leaving Brenda, I send an email to ask Ian what he thinks of this. I also ask if he will visit me in Japan. Back in the US, it is the middle of the night. It will take him a while to respond. In the late afternoon, I spend time in Shid Anagawa Koen, a small garden at the end of my street. Eiko-san says the poet Basho wrote about this garden, but I am unable to locate the writing. The garden is home to a strange kind of bird, seemingly part pheasant, part duck, part wild turkey, that squawks at me as I approach. At dusk, I often walk along the shadow at Agawa, more a canal than a river, across from the garden. This evening is a milky dusk, 
Everything blends with the increasingly darker grayish blue sky. Though the soon to be night sky seems clear, the humidity makes it seem as if a mist envelops the canal. All perspective vanishes. This is the atmospheric limpidity of which Lovkario Hearn writes upon his arrival in Japan. Everything near and everything distant is sharply focused. Leaning on the metal balustrade along the river, I realize it has never been so clear how I've internalized everything the world threw my way about my different body to the point where the feelings seem my own. In Japan, if people stare at me, it is because I am a gaijin. Here, where people keep their feelings about my disability to themselves and do not accost me on the street, my experience of being different has in a short time already contradicted my worst fears and expectation. Walking back to my apartment, I think of Ian, about how I buy him a souvenir and postcard everywhere I go. But now there is no refuge, no relationship waiting for me at home. My life is here, walking the streets of my Tokyo neighborhood, a single man. After taking off my shoes in the Genkan, I look at my apartment. The kitchen counter, the kitchen sink, the bathroom sink, the bathroom mirror, are all easily managed, unlike the two high counters and sinks in my American house. I think how the tiny unit bathroom with one source of water for both shower and sink is so small that Ian would not fit in it. Here in Tokyo, the space doesn't feel small. I think of all the things I owned back in Massachusetts, the 20 bookcases filled with books, the files with manuscript drafts and correspondence, paintings from ex-boyfriends, a collection of Balinese art, my 80 Pikachus. Here I feel unencumbered. The clock ticks loudly. Back home I couldn't sleep, read, or even talk on the phone if I heard a clock ticking this loudly. The street traffic and distant highway noise kept me awake. Here in Tokyo, I ignore the ticking of a clock. Traffic no longer disturbs me. So that's just the, the very beginning of my, of my journey to Japan, um, which was an experience that totally changed my life. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a few things. Um, my husband just put his head in the room because I met him in Japan. So <laughs> when I was on my Fulbright actually. Um, so um, he's Canadian, he's, he was teaching English when I was there. Um, so I wanted to talk about a few things that I thought could be helpful. Um, when I was in Japan and I, I, I gave talks a lot, uh, I was always asked the question, what is it like to be disabled in Japan? But I couldn't answer this question because I could only answer what it was like for this particular foreigner with my specific disability to, to be in Japan. So, um, when, as I mentioned before, when I went to Japan on a Fulbright, I had previously spent time there um, on, on another grant. And also uh, since, since then, dis my disability began to require just dis different needs. Um, for example, then I didn't use a wheelchair, but today I use a wheelchair for distance. So my experience in Japan would be very different now than it was back then. I mean, this is when I first arrived in Japan on my first grant, it was 2002, and my Fulbright was 2005, 2006. So things have Things have also changed a bit in Japan. Um, so what Fulbright did provide um, was someone to help me travel from the US to Japan and vice versa since I couldn't carry things and you know, deal with all that. Um, this was very easy. I asked and the State Department said yes. I mean, it was a very, very easy thing. Uh, what I see as the biggest impediment to having more disabled Fulbrighters is the, is the issue of health insurance. Uh, the insurance provided by Fulbright does not cover pre-existing conditions. And this is something I've talked about for decades and nothing has changed. I imagine it's a very difficult thing to change, but um, that's a real, that's a, that's, I'd say that's probably the, the, the largest impediment for disabled people to, to, go, to go abroad on a Fulbright. Um, I was still covered by my, uh, by my health insurance from where I was, from my, my teaching job. So I was kind of lucky. 
Um, and the first time I was there, I actually was not able to get on Japanese health insurance because I wasn't going to be there long enough. When I was there on my Fulbright, I was able to get on, 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 the, on Japanese national health insurance. Um, so there are some things that I think are interesting to, just, to consider. Um, if someone does need an assistant or an aid, local or non-professional aids are not sufficient. I don't know if you followed what happened to some Paralympians um, going to Tokyo this year for the Olympics, but they were told they couldn't bring their usual aid with them. Um, and uh, it's, it's not sufficient. There needs to be, I think there really needs to be funds for a Fulbrighter who needs an aid to come with them and live with them in the host country. I mean, I think that's really, really important. Um, people just think, oh, we have, you know, a volunteer from the university who can help. It's not, it's not going to cut it. Um, before departure, uh, U.S. organizations such as Mobility International USA, MIUSA, could be helpful. Um, and also contacting former disabled Fulbrighters would also probably be a good idea. Um, for both, for both uh, the staff and for the, the Fulbrighter themselves. So what can you do? Um, I think finding accessible housing that could be available to disabled Fulbrighters beforehand, not upon not waiting until they get there. Um, having such a resource list would be helpful to those who need accessible housing. And similarly, getting to know your local disability organizations as they could be an important resource for both you and the, and, and the Fulbrighter. I think there needs to be one person in charge of accessibility needs for disabled Fulbrighters within the, the program, with, especially for those countries that have their own commissions. Um, having a dedicated staff member, somebody the Fulbrighter can get to know and trust would, would be helpful. Um, keep in mind that sometimes asking for assistance for one, what needs is not easy. A lot of people um, feel that they've been given this opportunity and if they ask for too much, they're gonna be sent away, <laughs> putting it bluntly. Um, so how can you ask Fulbrighters what they need to succeed without infringing on their privacy or assuming that they will need assistance or what that assistance might be? Coming up with a system that doesn't single out disabled Fulbrighters in this way, I think is, a, is an important way to go. Um, also for Fulbrighters going to the US, um, both you and they should know that the American Disabilities Act, the ADA covers them while they're in the US. Um, so you and they should know their civil rights while they live in the, in the, in the US. And the last thing is just something overall is to remember the disability experience is, a, is one of change, which makes it quite a universal experience. Uh, there's nothing more constant than change. Often needs will arise as the grantee arrives and experiences what to them will be a foreign culture. So it's something that they might not even realize that they need will become more apparent when they start to, to live there. And it could change the first month could be different than the fourth month. So those are the things that I that I thought you know might be be helpful to open up a conversation and uh, and you know things that I thought that you might want to think about. So um, I'm to take questions. I know Kelly had a few um, that that came in. So yeah. Thank you so much, Kenny. Um, it was really lovely to hear you read from your book. So one of the questions that came in, um, I think is related to what you have been discussing, which is about disclosure. Um, one person asked whether you disclosed your disability when you put in your original application. Well, <laughs> I've always had this interesting situation since my work is, 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 has been about disability for you know, so almost since the start. So, and my projects that are, are disability related. So, that's my disclosure. I mean, I don't know, you know, how much, I mean, I've been on, I, I served on the creative writing panel in the U, on the U.S. side for, for Fulbright. So I don't know what the staff members would get to know about the people once they get there. So I don't know how much disclosure is there. But I, my work is just, you know, I have to apply for teaching jobs. I would have to go and read, you know, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, all these things about my life, because that's what I, that's what I write about. So it's a, I think it's a little bit different for me than it would be for somebody else. So it's a, so that's a hard, it's a hard one to answer because my disclosure is, is in my work. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Um, another question that was related to that was in the case um, where we have participants who are not disclosing certain aspects of their identity, whether that be disability or anything else, what advice do you have for practices um, that local staff can, can engage in to make you know, Fulbright programs inclusive without having to know exactly what's going on with people. You know, people should be able to come in and keep their private life private if that's what they wish to do. Um, is there any advice that you can give to us about how we can make an inclusive environment for everyone without needing to know the personal information of every grantee or participant? Yeah, I mean, as I kind of alluded to um, in the points I was making that I think some sort of system where I don't know, if you get too general, then people kind of ignore the question. But some general question on a form, or I don't know what, what people use these days when people are about to arrive you know, in, in, on a Fulbright in, in your country. Um, but to have some sort of question like, what can we do to make your experience more sex successful? This could include any excess access needs, um, I don't know, language barriers, you just not only, not only pinpoint a disability in it, but make it a more general question. That might help. Um, I mean, it really, really depends. I mean, you know, I know that you're dealing with people who are, you know, uh, in the, you know, the, the teaching English program, I forget what it's called, up to senior scholars. So you're gonna get, and even without that, you're gonna have senior scholars who don't know how to ask or think they could do everything by themselves, et cetera, and so forth. I think those who live with AIDS or people who might be deaf, I mean, those people, I think for the most part will tell you what they need, um, but even then you can't, you can't take it for granted. So I think there needs to be a way to find out where it's not, Suzanne and I have talked about this, Suzanne Hampshire, um, about finding a way to ask this question that doesn't pinpoint a specific difference or you know um, category. Yeah. Yes, yeah. The final question that was sent in with the registration was, um, what are some of your favorite creative works that pass the freeze test? And maybe you can explain to everybody what the freeze test is first. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a little have a thing or thing here from last night on that. Um, the freeze test is something I put together um, that basically was questions to ask about whether a, a, a piece, a narrative piece of work, so it's basically basically for literature or film, was uh, was accurately portraying disability. Um, it's akin to the Bechdel test, which Alison Bechdel did for for women, um, and so. I came up with this kind of on a lark. I had a colleague who I teach with who was going to teach a, a workshop on appropriation. And she said, oh, by the way, is there a, a test for disability like the Bechdel test for women? And I said, no, there isn't. She was like, what would it be if there was? And I came up with these three, these three questions. Um, and then my publicist uh, was actually at the time when in the province of the gods first was published in 2017 be very happy to let you know that it's just out in paperback four years later. Um, and, uh, and I just came up with these questions. So the questions are, um, does a work have more than one disabled character? Do the disabled characters have their own narrative purpose other than the education and profit of a non-disabled character? Is the character's disability not eradicated either by curing or killing? So those are the three very simple um, very simple questions to ask. Um, I'll answer this question in a roundabout way. Um, Nicola Griffith, who is a, a disabled author, most known for her fantasy work, um, Hild, uh, when she had a book, uh, when she read the freeze test, she wrote an article for the New York Times that talked about how if, if we had uh, accurate portrayals of disabled people in our culture, that was commensurate with the percentage of the population, we probably have millions. <laughs> she put on her website a call for people to write in what works they thought met the free test. And she came, I think they came up with 57 or 67 at the time. So if you think of the difference between that and millions, you see the, the issue. It's very, very difficult, honestly, for me to come up with, with work that actually passes the freeze test. Um, 
One is probably Good Kings, Bad Kings, a novel by Susan Nussbaum, who's um, one of the funniest people on the planet. Um, it's, a, it's a novel that won the, the, um, the Bellwether Prize for socially engaged fi fi fiction. Um, it used to be called the, the King Solver Prize because Barbara King Solver, I think, funds it. Um, and uh, sh the book is about a group of a multi-racial disabled people who, who are in an institution and their struggles to get out and to live, you know, independent lives. Um, so I think that's one of them. And it's written in the voice of these multiple disabled characters. Um, most of the most of the work that does this successfully is not fiction for some reason. It's mostly nonfiction. Um, I mean, my work would probably pass the freeze test. Um, uh, the work of Anne Finger um, passes the freeze test. She's a, a, a both a fiction writer and a nonfiction writer. I highly recommend her book of short stories, um, Call Me Ahab, which she calls fictional histories of disability, things like Van Gogh applying for, for social security. Um, uh, she has this wonderful story, Helen and Frida, which I included in Staring Back about this imaginary meeting between Helen Keller um, and, and Frida Kahlo. Um, so those are a few things that come to mind. I mean, if you're really interested, I think if you look up on Nicola Griffith's um, uh, website, she probably still has the, the call about this on there. Um, so um, I could type um, her uh, her name uh, there and see see what other people have said. Interestingly enough, if I remember correctly, most of the things that people wrote in to that that passed the freeze test were um, fiction were were um, fantasy <laughs> books, fantasy genre. Um, I mean, that's also in in Nicola's in 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 her wheelhouse. So, but it was interesting to to see that. But yeah, I mean, I could tell you very famous things that do not pass the face test. <laughs> I mean, that, I, could go, I could go on and on and on forever. I mean, even the Pulitzer Prize winning play, Cost of Living, written by a non-disabled person that has two disabled characters in it, the two characters never speak to each other and one of them dies at the end. So, um, yeah. Well, thanks, Kenny. Um, it's great. I like having this list of, of books that we can check out and different works of art. And I know that um, this has also been part of your career is, is, you know, this encouraging artists in travel through Fulbright um, to be able to explore their identities in this cross-cultural or different cultural setting. Um, that's really fascinating. I would like now to, I'm going to stop the recording and really would like to invite everyone to um, discuss and ask questions. So please feel free to unmute yourself and just ask the question or raise a hand, whatever you're comfortable with doing. I see we have a comment here from Paul in the chat. If Paul, you'd like to um, start us off or anyone else, and I'll stop the recording now. <laughs> 